The following program was produced by the United States Courts. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Uh, it's very fortunate that uh, my presence here coincides with a mission that brought me to Washington during this week. Uh, I'm coordinating and accompanying uh, a group of 15 scholars from China, from the People's Republic of China, who are doing an intensive exploration uh, of the United States, uh, beginning in Washington this week and then going on to Boston, San Francisco, and finally to, our, to the host state and city in Honolulu. Uh, I was asked to speak to you briefly about uh, the uh, origins and challenges of simultaneous interpreting relating to my experience at the Nuremberg Trials. You heard from Xavier also some of my background but let me just, from an autobiographical point of view, just say briefly how I got to Nuremberg and what, what brought me there and what made it possible for me to, to actually stay there for four years from the beginning of, of the, during the pre-trial phase, the trial itself, the big international trial, and the 12 subsequent proceedings. In other words, four years from 1945 to 1949. Now, the fact that I'm able to stand here and speak to you about this, in a way, also has to do with my age at that time, because my contemporaries at that time are no longer with us. In fact, the main actors, the chief actors at Nuremberg, whether they are the judges or the prosecutors or the defense counsel or the defendants themselves, are no longer alive, because at that time, as you could imagine, they were, I mean, we're talking about an event that took place 60 years ago. And then those people at that time were in their 40s and 50s. Uh, but in my case, what happened was that I was unusually young. I mean, I was as young as, as 22, 22 years old at that time. I'm right now 86, but I was 22 then. Uh, and it's quite amazing that I was, employed, I would not uh, have employed myself at that time. <laughs> but uh, but let, me, uh, let me come to that. Uh, as you heard, uh, I lived in London. I mean, I, I was born in Vienna. Uh, then I, my studies and my life in London was, was, you know, was interrupted by, by World War II. I stayed in London during the Blitz. And as the tides of the war changed in favor of the Allies towards the end, of World War II and the advance into Germany, there was need for linguists hmm, uh, to, especially in, in the case of helping the US tr troops, uh, of having linguists available with logistics, uh, with disarmament issues, and so on. So I was attached uh, to actually a 9th US Air Force battalion uh, that was advancing uh, into Germany to help them with their logistics, with the battalion, uh, dealing with uh, Germans, uh, uh, dealing with requisitions, dealing with logistics, also dealing with uh, interrogations and collection of materials that would be sent to a central screening agency for their significance uh, for, for the Allies. And in doing that, and this was early, I was close, came close. Actually, we were at the university city called Erlangen in Germany, very close to, to Nuremberg. And it, it was just that the war had just ended, and I really heard rumors that the heads of state, the, the, the chiefs of in, in, in crucial, in leading positions in Germany had been arrested and were awaiting trial at Nuremberg. I took, I went to, to Nuremberg to inquire about this, talked to the adjutant general, and was told, they heard about my background, was told I was really needed. Uh, I, I won't go into detail because it takes some time, but it so happened that uh, the colonel of the battalion, who, who was in fact my superior with that battalion, 
uh, had no interest whatsoever in Nuremberg and said, there's nothing doing, you stay here and, and I, won't, I won't let you go. So literally, I described that in my autobiography, which has just been published. Uh, I realized uh, that there's nothing I could do, but when I received orders to return to London, uh, I made a decision, and it was a decision that influenced the rest of my life and it is not to obey these orders uh, to go to a Frankfurt air base and return to London, because I knew that once I returned to London, the situation right at the end of the war in Germany was so chaotic, uh, the channels of command were so confused in a way that we would never be able to get back. So I made a decision hmm, not to obey these orders and simply go to Nuremberg myself without getting on that aeroplane. By that time, I'd lost my jeep and, and driver, and I had to get out to the autobahn, uh, really to, to hitchhike a ride uh, to Nuremberg, presented myself to the adjutant general, and then from that time on, I was immediately immersed in the, first of all, in the pre-trial phase, setting this, doing all of the necessary preparations uh, for, the, for the trial uh, itself. You may ask what happened to my AWOL status, absent without leave. Well, it so happened that about, uh, there was a, a military police uh, detachment, I think there was a sergeant and a military police captain, who caught up with me in Nuremberg. But I had no problems, because the Nuremberg trials had a top priority in the European theater at that time. And uh, they smoothed the way for me, and, and there was no problem. Well, let me say first, before we're getting into the simultaneous issues, something about the pre-trial interrogations, which were conducted on a consecutive level, uh, where the accused and some key witnesses were brought into interrogation rooms, and there was a number of prosecutors and lawyers uh, who would actually prepare the, both the testimony and the documentary evidence, which would be the basis of, of the trials. Sometimes when I'm asked uh, what most impressed me uh, about my career uh, at Nuremberg, at the Nuremberg trials, I will often say uh, it was these pre-trial interrogations who were done exactly. And why, why am I saying that? It was because this was an experience of history in the raw, raw history. What I mean by that is this was an, op an occasion where the leaders of a nation that had been totally defeated, where the infrastructure of that nation was totally destroyed, and those leaders of the nations were given an opportunity to articulate and express themselves during that pre-trial phase, very often very anxious to express themselves. When this was done before the testimony was filtered by defense counsel, or by defense strategy. It was prior to any kind of strategy. It was very much uh, uh, spontaneous and uh, extremely interesting. But then, as the preparations for the trials advanced, the question came up on how to deal with the language issues and the language barriers. And it was evident that the languages that were needed were obviously were German, was the, la the language of the defendants, of the accused, uh, of defense counsel and so on. And then when it came to the international judges and the prosecution, uh, we had the US prosecution team, the British prosecution, French prosecution, and Soviet. At that time, we called it Soviet uh, rather, than, rather than Russian. So it was important uh, that uh, the proceedings be understood by all, not only by all of the participants uh, at Nuremberg in the Nuremberg trials, but in a sense by the world, because uh, this was an occasion for media uh, from all over the world you know, to come to Nuremberg. In a sense, it was one of the most important media events uh, at the end of World War II. And they were reporting on the trials to their respective communities in their respective countries, and they needed to do that, obviously, in their own languages, and they needed to uh, understand what was going on. So now, how to deal with this dilemma. Because if we had to do it consecutively, it would have just, I mean, you couldn't conceive on how 
cumbersome it would be, how boring it would be, and how difficult it would be. It, just, it was just not acceptable. So you know the English proverb, the English saying, necessity is the mother of invention. So if something is really necessary, there is some ingenious way you know, to deal with it. And in fact, it's very hard to pinpoint the originator of the, the notion, the theme of simultaneous interpreting. But I think a key person was a man called Léon Doster, uh, who was a colonel in the US Army, but of French origin, of, brought up in France and was bilingual in French and English, had also served as an interpreter to General Eisenhower himself. And he was one of the key persons you know, with, with that vision, with that ideas. So that during the pre-trial phase, that during that phase before the international trial, uh, we had a relatively short time, no more than, I would say, three or four months, uh, uh, to, to make those preparations. And there were two aspects to it. One was the human aspect. Of course, that was the key aspect to choosing the people who were able to do that and dealing with the criteria uh, for these kinds of choices. And I'll come to that in a moment. But then there was also the technical aspect on how, how technically to do that. Now, nowadays, now in, uh, throughout the world, we are so technically able that we don't really think of these things. We know that, uh, that things can be uh, can be electronically handled very efficiently. But keep in mind, now we're dealing with 1945. Keep in mind that at that time, even the tape that we now use had not yet been used or invented. So recording was done through a wire, wire recording. So at that time, IBM had already existed and helped with the technical setup of, of dealing uh, with a simultaneous system. Uh, uh, let me, let me go back to the, to the choice of personnel. We started out with the language division at Nuremberg, in other words, with some of the people who were already involved in the translation of documents, uh, who were document uh, translators, in order to see whether they could be used in the courtroom on the microphone, you know, to be dealing uh, simultaneously. Uh, and we found that that was a very, very difficult thing to do. Uh, we set up a system of sort of mock trials in preparation in, in, to test people to see if they're able to respond immediately to s language stimuli and, and handle that. And in many cases, they were not. In many cases, these were people who were outstanding linguists, scholars, uh, who had translated books and so on, but uh, were not able to handle uh, this notion of dealing with the language stimulus in such a way that it could be useful for simultaneous interpreting. However, some, uh, in fact, uh, what the stumbling block for some of those very learned people was, is that they were perfectionists. And it, it, it is good to be a perfectionist, you know, when you have the time and you're translating a book or a journal. But you can't be a perfectionist uh, when you have to respond to an immediate uh, stimulus. So in other words, it c called for the ability to think of the second best word instantly, or even the third best word, because you could not afford to stop. If you stop, there's a breakdown in what you're doing. So it, it required that kind of language agility, yeah, which we found out turned out to be rather rare yeah, and not as easy to find. But anyway, we managed to bring a team uh, together, actually, we, we needed a team of 12 each, three teams, about 36 people. When I say 12, and I'm sure many of you now are familiar with that, we would essentially have an English booth. So the English glass booth would be German in, into English, which, by the way, was my function. I was on the English microphone uh, listening, uh, listening to German and speaking English. So the English booth would have uh, German into English, French into English, and Russian into English, and they, they would share one, one booth and, in, in essence, uh, one microphone. And then there would be the German booth, English into German, French into German, Russian into German, and they would be on the German microphone. The same would be true for, for Russian, uh, and the same, the same would, be, would be due for French. And to coordinate all of that, there would also be a monitor who was sitting by the side, 
that later on in the subsequent proceedings was often uh, my position, would sort of turn the dial and listen to all of them, you know, to deal with, uh, with possible breakdowns and so on. Um, so, so we, we had these, two, these teams where uh, the procedure was some, something like this. They would be in the courtroom much longer than we do it usually now for about an hour and a half or, or two hours uh, sitting on that, on that microphone. Of course, when the verbatim language was a given language, was English or German, or whatever it was, you would hear verbatim through the earphones. In other words, there was no need for somebody interpreting it into German, you know, when a German witness was speaking, and that, that would have been done uh, verbatim. Uh, we would then, uh, after, as we, was, as we were speaking, court reporters would take down the testimony. Both the testimony as it came through verbatim, directly, but also especially, but the testimony that was coming through the earphones. So there would be a, a group of French court reporters, German court reporters, English court reporters, and Russian court reporters. And the court reporters would go into the courtroom and do takes of 15 or 20 minutes in the courtroom. Uh, they would use the stenotype or sometimes stenograph, and then they would go back into their offices and uh, would, would transcribe. And I, without going into details, let me just tell you that, uh, and I think it was a, quite a feat, that at the end of a working day of the trials, there was a transcript uh, that was ready in four languages, in English, French, Russian, and German. Uh, now, it was not a Polish transcript. Uh, for example, what I had to do uh, when I was say for 90 minutes uh, in the courtroom, I would then go to, to my office and I would have in front of me, uh, uh, through wire recording, the verbatim version of what was, uh, what was said and I had, I had my, my translate. And I was able to do, make a quick review. And since we're dealing really with life and death matters, we had to be careful that no, no mistakes were done. But there was not enough time to really polish it and to have it a polished version, but enough attention was paid that we were sure that it'd be accurate and it was possible uh, for, for, this, for, for, for the lawyers, for the prosecutors, and for defense counsel, and for judges to review uh, what had been done. We faced a great ma many challenges. We faced challenges of special uh, terminology, military terminology, for example, in the medical trial, in one of the subsequent proceedings, there was a great deal of medical terminology. And all of that presented great challenges uh, to, the, to the court interpreters. To so it, it meant that we needed, to some extent possible, to have preparation for these, these challenges. Uh, for example, to, to request in advance to know uh, what would be happening in the courtroom and what kinds of things we need to be prepared for. We also ha had one, and many of you are interpreters in the room would, would uh, relate to this. Uh, uh, there is a difference between uh, free, spontaneous talk and then and, and written, written language. In other words, if a witness or, or a prosecutor, defense counsel, was reading a document uh, in the courtroom, and if that document was not also available to the interpreter, it caused a, a tremendous problem. It, it's sometimes almost as difficult as, as being even able to do that. So we made very sure that everyone active in, in this proceedings knew that the interpreters had, had to have this material in, in, in front, front of them. Uh, but there were many challenges. I mentioned medical terminology. To give you an example, on medical terminology, we know that most of the medical terms uh, have Latin roots. So sometimes the only difference between la one language and another language on medical terminology was the pronunciation 
uh, that, that would fit that particular language. And though very often the interpreters themselves did not understand the technical aspects of it, they were able to use that system to make it intelligible to those people you know, who, in the audience you know, who, who, needed, who needed to know. Ideally, we, we realized when the simultaneous interpreting system worked well, uh, the person in the courtroom, whether it was a visitor in the spectator's gallery or, or counsel or judges and so on, uh, were not really conscious of the presence of an interpreter. They were just listening to the proceedings as though they were hearing the actors you know, speak themselves in, in that language. And then that's when it worked very smoothly. We developed a system of traffic lights where we had uh, orange light and orange light go on, which is a warning signal, which meant uh, that uh, counsel was speaking too quickly. And at that point, the judges uh, would caution uh, whoever was on the microphone to, to speak slowly. Or situations where uh, the actors in the courtroom were very agitated and, and trying to speak at the same time. And, and when they were doing that, obviously the simultaneous interpreting system did not work. So we, we had the cooperation uh, of the justice who were very uh, conscious of the fact that we faced difficult challenges and were trying to be as, as helpful as possible. And I think they are particularly of the president you know, of, of, the, of the International Military Tribunal, uh, Sir Je Jeffrey Lawrence, uh, br the British, who was very, very careful about helping the interpreters at that time in order to meet those, those challenges. We also had some issues uh, dealing with what some of us described a so-called Nazi German, or, or official uh, National Socialist policy uh, German uh, that was used in the court. And by that we, mean, we meant that very often, uh, where there were several tr translations possible, perhaps one, one version would be innocuous and another version would be quite incriminatory, uh, one could choose one or the other. Let me give you an example because it's difficult to, to describe that without an example. Uh, there was a, it, this happened in my case and it, it put myself into an, an interesting role. Uh, the testimony said uh, that, that uh, a certain number of the population in, in, in eastern Ukraine, for example in, in, in Russia, was seized uh, and gotten ready for de deportation uh, to other parts of, of, of Ukraine and so on. So I had to deal with that verb, that population was seized. Now when you take that verb translated to the German, you have, I mean from German into English, I used the term seized, which fit the context perfectly so far as I was concerned. However, that particular verb could also be translated that th th that population was registered. Now, the difference between seize and registered, seize has an aggressive connotation. Registered has a totally innocuous connotation. I use the term seized on the microphone. Why? Because it fit the context perfectly. Whereas, however, Defense counsel caught it. Among the defense counsel, there were quite a number of them who spoke English quite well and who were usually following the procedure with one part of the earphone onto the translation and one to the original. And they raised an objection saying that that should have been translated as registered and not, not as seized. Now, how that affected me in an interesting and almost humorous way is that for the next 15 minutes or so on the microphone, I was involved in interpreting a discussion about my interpretation, <laughs> <laughs> which sort of went, went, went back and forth un until finally uh, Chief Justice Lawrence did something that he, he often had to do and judges have to do and saying is we will end this, this discussion 
and the tribunal would take it into consideration and deal with it when the time comes. So that, that just gives you, gives you an idea. Um, as I mentioned, I stayed uh, with, no, let me just before I do that, let me talk about another challenge I think that may, may resonate with you. And that has to do with translation from German uh, into English. Those of you who have studied German and or know something about German or, those, or German speakers amongst you know that in the subordinate clause, the verb comes at the very end of a subordinate clause. So in other words, you have uh, various uh, adjectives and adverbs and so on preceding, preceding the verb, and then fi finally you have the verb at the end. Now that presented a great challenge to the interpreter because when you speak English, uh, the verb anchors the sentence. In other words, you need it, you need it immediately so that you could not afford to wait huh, until you heard the verb huh, at the end of the clause in order to use it. Because by that time, whoever was speaking had already gone on beyond that and, and there would be a, would be a breakdown. Uh, so we developed uh, a, a system of dealing with that through language segments and taking the adverbial clause that preceded the verb uh, and making a short sentence out of it until the verb is heard and then have the verb include everything that had preceded it. Now, as I explain it now, that sounds awfully complicated and very difficult, but actually it is not. Once you get a hang of that system, you know, it, it worked very well and allowed us uh, to keep pace. Uh, during the trials, as you know, and during all simultaneous interpreting, it requires a great deal of focus and a great deal of concentration and also something becoming to being in, in tune to some extent uh, with how the person is speaking and, and engaging that. And, and once, once you capture that, then there's a flow and then you just go with the flow and it it tends to, to work uh, pretty well. There's another interesting aspect to that process. Uh, to give you an example, in my case, from time to time, I would be spending an hour or two in front of the microphone, and then there would be a recess, and I'd go outside to the corridor, outside of the courtroom, and people who had not been spectating were interested in what was going on, and they would ask me, well, what happened here and what happened there? And I was unable to respond. And why was I unable to respond? Because in some ways, when you have that kind of a focus and that concentration, you're in almost in a trance-like situation. You're doing it correctly, but you, it's a quasi-trance. And then you come out, and it's very difficult to reconstruct eh, what had gone on and what had gone on pre previously. Uh, I'm very often asked, you see, uh, keep in mind that, uh, you know, at that time, as I mentioned, I, I was a very young fellow. I was 22, 23 years old. I was asked very often, uh, and I'm asked now, what was, what was your reaction to the, to the trials in terms of the, the war crimes and the crimes against humanity and, and the things that happened later with the Holocaust and so on? Uh, and how, how did you react? How did you feel about all of, these, all of that kind of a testimony uh, that was coming across at that time? And then I, I would say, I had to say that I was so focused on the linguistic, on the language challenges, and I was in a sense uh, too young to really deal with the full impact in international law, for example, of the Nuremberg trials, so that my concern was really basically doing a good job linguistically and preparing myself well enough that I could handle that job. However, it, as later, 10, 20 years later, in my later career, my later work, I became more and more interested in the impact of the trial, in the legal implications. And since then, I've lectured about it and I've written about it. It's not the theme of this conference here, but it is something that that I've been doing and, and I'm still required to do. 
I've just written it. Some of you have it. Some, it'll be available here after my, my talk. I've written an autobiography, a book of memoirs, which is entitled Nuremberg and Beyond. Now, in that book, I do deal not only with some of the challenges in simultaneous interpreting that I've just enumerated, uh, but also with the impact of the trial, with the legal implications, uh, with the role of the trials uh, preceding the Tokyo trials. We followed a year later the trials at The Hague that have been going on, what is happening in Cambodia, and so on. In other words, Nuremberg set the stage for a phase in international law, uh, which uh, is still going on today. Let me say something about the interpreters at Nuremberg, the kind of people who were gathered there. And uh, it, it was an interesting mix of people. Uh, different age groups were represented. I mean, very few as young as I am, but some of them are coming from academia, some of them actually had already had experience as interpreters in Geneva. Uh, uh, so, so it was a very mixed group. And we've, we've also formed a social group and formed friendships. Unfortunately, most of them uh, are, are no, no longer alive. But I did keep in touch with quite, quite a number of them. And then we had also close connections with the court reporters, for example, uh, as a linguist at Nuremberg, I had one of my duties, in addition to simultaneous interpreting from time to time to phases, and it's, you'll see me when you see photos of the Nuremberg trials, you, will often, you might see my face underneath the tier of judges. And in those, on those occasions, uh, my job uh, was to give information to the court reporters that they needed in order to transcribe. For example, they were unable to deal with German place names, with names of military ranks, of all kinds of proper nouns and proper words uh, that were not in their experience. And they would, uh, I mean, they would come to full stop in their transcribing. So I would, I would listen for all of these things. And as the court reporter finished that take of 15 or 20 minutes, I would hand them the sheet of paper where all of that huh, was written so that when they did their transcription, you know, they could do it, do it smoothly. As I said, at that time, uh, simultaneous interpreting had not yet been done. But when we move fast forward uh, to the 21st century, right now, it has become an aspect of the linguistic training. Uh, every major university, uh, has a department that, that trains people in, in, in simultaneous interpreting. Uh, it, it has become uh, something that is accepted everywhere where there's an international gathering. And I would I'd like to think that the skill and the ability to handle that also has grown quite, quite a bit, so that, that it has not only become an accepted profession, but also that the ability level uh, you know, has increased a great deal. There's a great deal more uh, to be said uh, about translation and about uh, simultaneous interpreting. Uh, in my life right now is not involved with that anymore. You know, I'm, I'm at the moment in, in a fellow, at the, an adjunct fellow at the East-West Center, which is a center that deals with the understanding of the Asia-Pacific region. And in that, obviously, I deal primarily uh, in English. But to some extent, uh, I've used my language background in, in the community in terms of uh, uh, working with various uh, uh, community groups uh, in, in, a, in a variety of capacities. I'm a, I'm a founder, for example, in Hawaii of the Alliance Francaise that encourage uh, the French culture. In my case, I'm in this, I would describe myself as trilingual, uh, English, French, and German. But in, in addition to that, although I have not mastered that, because my work takes me frequently uh, to Asia, so I'm very often in Japan and in the People's Republic of China, other places, 
So I've picked up a smattering of those languages, but I would only describe them as, as street Chinese or, or street, street Japanese, and I have not really, you know, I'm not able to deal with it. It's, it's kind of curious because when I say something in, in, in Chinese, or if I say something in Japanese, because of my background as a linguist, uh, my pronunciation tends to be quite good. So when I say something, there's a flood that comes back to me in response, <laughs> and then I'm totally lost. So, 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 so that's one of the perils of having a good pronunciation. <laughs> when, you travel, when you have a limited vocabulary and a good pronunciation, it can get you into a lot of trouble. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me conclude by saying uh, that I'm very glad to be here. But there's a lot to be said about my subject, but I would prefer to deal with your interest, particular interest that brings you here, and any questions, or if my remarks have stimulated any particular question that, where you would like to have my comment. So please feel free to express yourself in, in terms of, of my talk. As the years went on, I would imagine that you created relationships within the courtroom with the different participants. How did you, did the interpreters and the rest of the group keep that relationship that you might have created from actually influencing and the knowledge you were gaining throughout the years from influencing the day-to-day -day hearings? Yeah. Well, I, actually, I, we were quite professional about it. It, it did not uh, actually affect uh, ourselves vis-a-vis vis vis the defendants. We, uh, Socially, we had many different opportunities to get together among interpreters, among linguists, among reporters, among journalists. I, in particular, had many friendships among, among the journalists that came because, as I mentioned, it was a big media event and, and we would, would relate to one another. We had many incidents. You know, in the medical trial, I was very much involved with the medical trial from beginning to end, and these were Nazi German doctors uh, who were accused of uh, doing experiments on concentration camp inmates, on, on prisoners of war, uh, all kinds of very cruel experiments like being exposed to salt water without anything else until the point of death in order to, f I mean, they're very, or, or injecting uh, Polish women with gangrene in order to see what kind of, they, they, their, uh, their response uh, in, the, in their defense, which was not accepted as a defense, was that this was all done in a spirit of medical science. But in fact, there was no progress in medical science as a result of these experiments. But that, uh, that was their defense. But apropos of incidents, I remember once, uh, the, it was during the medical trial, and I developed a, an irritation on my skin, on, on my cheek that just wouldn't disappear. Now remember that one of the defendants, and those, those doctors on, in the dock, some of them had international reputations and were renowned medical scholars and were still pursuing that. Well, anyway, one of those doctors beckoned me over and he looked at my skin irritation and he scribbled something, which was a prescription, and, ha and handed it to me. <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he said, you know, you, you, you can take that to a pharmacy and that irritation will disappear. Now, just as curiosity at Nuremberg, I, I did take it to a, to a pharmacy, and, and the pharmacy said that this is a very popular salve or something, and that it, it's perfectly okay. And just, just, <laughs> not, not, <laughs> there's nothing you need to worry about. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this is just one anecdote of, of many. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed particularly the French delegation uh, we were billeted in Nuremberg, uh, in the suburbs of Nuremberg, in some cases in the university town of Erlangen and Dambach, and we would very often get together you know, for social occasions. Uh, in, in a sense, my life in Hawaii really has to do with, uh, you, know, it, you know the expression in, in, French, in, in French, when you read French books, if you want to know why, a male, a man, moves from one place to another, it was said, cherchez la femme. That means, <laughs> look for the woman. And, and, 
And if you, if you find out where the mom, woman goes, you know, the man may well follow. Well, I, I married, I met a court reporter of, uh, actually of, of Hawaiian descent, who, who was one of the first court reporters from Hawaii in, in, in Europe, and we, we got married in Paris, and uh, the fact that we got married really launched uh, my career in Hawaii. Had, had, had I not met her, that, that would not have happened. Uh, on the outskirts of Nuremberg, there was a, an inn which we dubbed the French Club, where many members of the French delegation uh, would stay. We would often meet there and gather there for social events. There were many recesses called during the trials, and we were in a privileged position where we would be able, uh, during a recess, to, to fly free of charge to other various destinations in Europe uh, during, during recess periods. So, so these were some of the social events that took place. There was also a castle called the Stein Castle outside of Nuremberg where the press had stayed. And very often we had functions and social gatherings in, in that castle. In fact, when I got married in Paris afterwards, we had a, a reception right at, at that castle, at, you know, at, the, at the Stein Castle. Uh, among the journalists, some that may resonate amongst you, some of you, one of the journalists was a man who became very famous in the United States, passed away now, Walter Cronkite. Uh, Wal Walter Cronkite was at that time not a television reporter, but he, he wrote, a print reporter, he wrote for United Press and, and had, had duty. And there were many others who uh, also became quite well known. I think there's a question over there. Uh, I'm curious, uh, during the time that the trials were going on, and without going into specifics, did you consider that you were well paid as an interpreter or marginally paid or? Well, uh, by, by the standards at that time, it was okay. It was fairly well. By standards of today, it was pitifully small. <laughs> no, I think, if I can give you a figure, I'm not really quite sure anymore, but it was something to the equivalent of, of 3000 or $3,005 per year, which, which was not, not very much. But we didn't have many expenses. Uh, actually, uh, this was uh, the, the period right after World War II had just ended, uh, the German mark was worth nothing, and you had sort of military uh, notes as a other than marks. And people were paid in kind by Americans would buy coffee from the PX and then give it uh, to some Germans and so on. So there was a lot of barter and a lot of exchange going on. And for example, in my case, both my the woman I was to marry later as a court reporter, she was very busy in her profession and I was as an interpreter. We were very busy, but we had many facilities. I mean, we had a housekeeper, you know, to keep the house. We had a driver and a car, to, you know, to go wherever we wanted. So when you think about that, it was unusual for young people, a young couple in their 20s to have that, that kind of support. But it kind of went with the job, and it, it went with the conditions that, at time. But I think in some ways we were mature enough to realize that when the Nuremberg trials came to an end, and not only the major trial, but all the subsequent proceedings, we had some offers to stay on with the occupation in Germany and other related positions, which at that time would have been quite well paid and secured with all kinds of service. But we realized uh, that uh, it, it was necessary this was not life as it should be led, that one needed to take root somewhere, and it didn't make sense you know, to stay and go from one job like that overseas to another. So we decided, you know, we, I hadn't finished uh, my education, I needed to do more graduate work. My wife had other interests too. So we, we went to Hawaii. Our first idea was not to settle down in Hawaii, but just to visit her family and her parents and then go back either to the United States or to England to do something else. But then various positions and offers opened up in Hawaii, and I realized that Hawaii, rather than an isolated place, was really a bridge between the Asia-Pacific region and the mainland United States, and there were many opportunities there for me. And I became quite fascinated with the population, with the way of life, with the beauty of the country. So we've never regretted the fact 
know, that we've settled down there. There's this lady over there. Yes, Professor. Um, as interpreters, we emphasize the need to work in teams today, and studies have been done about interpreter fatigue. At the time that the Nuremberg trial took place, obviously there was no protocol as to how interpreters would work or for how long. And I imagine that there was an emotional toll on the interpreter also, as you say, when you describe when they were interpreting the medical experiments, et cetera. Yeah. How did you divide the work up to uh, yeah. prevent yourselves from getting yeah. too tired? Yeah. Well, I was involved in, in, in this aspect of it towards the end of the subsequent proceedings in the final two years when I was there. Uh, as mentioned, I was there from 1945 to 49. But as of late 47, 48, uh, I was appointed chief of the interpreting branch, or the, you know, at, at a very young age. And this is when I took these things into consideration. As chief of the interpreting branch, I, I still continued to be active on, on the microphone, but my main duty was really scheduling hmm, interpreters and, 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 and selecting them and making sure that uh, they were not overscheduled or, or, or underscheduled for that matter. And, and deal with those issues of potential fatigue. 